Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the Zendesk Q1 2020 earnings call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Mark Cobby. Thank you. Please go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, welcome to our first quarter 2020 earnings call. Uh, we're doing it virtually from our homes today, and we're pleased to report our results. Joining me on the call today are Mikkel Spain, our founder, CEO, and chair of the board, and Elena Gomez, our chief financial officer. During the course of today's call, we may make forward-looking statements, such as statements regarding our future financial performance, product development, growth prospects, ability to attract and retain customers, and ability to compete effectively. The assumptions, risks, and factors that could affect our actual results are contained in our earnings press release and in the risk factors section of our prior and subsequent filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, including our annual report on Form 10-K for the year ended December 31, 2019, and our upcoming quarterly report on Form 10-Q for the quarter ended March 31, 2020. We undertake no obligation to update these statements after today's presentation or to conform these statements to actual results or to changes in our expectations except as required by law, please refer to today's earnings release for more information regarding forward-looking statements. During this call, we will present both GAAP and non-GAAP financial measures. The non-GAAP financial measures should be considered in addition to, but not as a substitute or in isolation from our GAAP results. You can find additional disclosures regarding these non-GAAP financial measures, including the reconciliations with comparable GAAP financial measures in today's press release, the shareholder letter, and for certain non-GAAP financial measures for prior periods in the earnings press releases of those such prior periods. All of those are available on our investor website. With this intro, uh, I'm going to turn the call over to Mikkel. Hey, <clears throat> thanks so much, Mark. I hope I come through here uh, clear and loudly. Um, I had asked the team to, uh, if we couldn't do this earnings call by Zoom, uh, but apparently not. I thought that would have been very uh, appropriate. This is how we spend most of our days now uh, in meetings over Zoom. So uh, inviting our uh, shareholders or inviting our investors into our home offices would have been great. Anyway, um, I, I, I can't start without saying that, of course, the world has changed dramatically <laughs> since we last talked. The, the pandemic has disrupted daily life for us and for everyone in the world and created a lot of uncertainty for every single business out there. We focused at Tendesk on immediately responding to the crisis and of course planning for the future in this new world. Uh, we initially responded by helping our employees, of course, helping our customers and helping our communities through this disruption. We moved immediately to remote work globally within a few days. We assembled a customer response team to help customer manage big shifts in their customer service needs and in their business challenges. And we also launched a support bundle that were meant to assist uh, especially distributed teams. So we ramped up nonprofit access to, to our products and uh, expertise aid uh, in multiple kind of recovery efforts. And we also had a number of partners help us with these initiatives. I think what's been most impressive is seeing our customers respond. It's more important now than ever that for companies to connect with their customers globally and across the channels that customers are expecting to use today. So we've seen a rise in customer service volumes from many of our customers, some dramatic rises from, for a large segment of our customers. We've also seen much more reliance on self-service, on automated deflection, and an increase in messaging and chat conversations. 
Um, we have many examples. A lot of them are in the shareholder letter, but like one customer is powering uh, WhatsApp chatbots uh, through our uh, Sunshine platform that help, uh, that help people self-diagnose COVID-19 symptoms. We have another customer that has deployed self-service for government track and trace uh, applications. And uh, our uh, call center product, our voice product, is helping uh, 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 multiple healthcare providers managing medical conversations to triage care. So uh, a lot of activities, and we've really been on the forefront of trying to help our customers coping with this new situation. We're still in the early days, and I'm, I'm convinced we are not going to go back to business as usual anytime soon. We expect and we are preparing for a financial impact in the near and the immediate term to ourselves, of course, but to the world around us. But we also believe that where the world is going through this tragic pandemic is also where Sendesk excels. Companies will seek half the time to value in their investments. They're not going to draw out, they're not going to do with uh, uh, drawn out implementations, complicated products, and like very slow time to value. This truly plays to our strengths, and we can see that in the response in the market. It plays to our strengths in being simple to do business with, being easy to use, and delivering very fast results. So we're gonna to plan to double down on these strengths to come out of the pandemic in an even stronger position, helping businesses all over the world respond to their customers in the most convenient and most easy way. Um, before I'm going to turn it over to Elena, I want to thank all our customers. We have customers across more than 160,000 160, paid accounts. I want to thank every single one of them for trusting us. Uh, we're doing everything we can to help you because we know that you, our customers, you are the key to our success. I also want to say that most importantly, we are, of course, super grateful for the healthcare professional, the first responders, the station workers out there, and especially, of course, the, the, the healthcare professionals, first responders, et cetera, in our own families, in our own, in our own neighborhoods, in our own communities. So thank you to all of you for, for keeping everything going and allowing centers also to continue to operate and continue to uh, excel. So thank you. And uh, with that, Elena, I want to uh, uh, turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Nichols. I'm going to discuss a few Q1 highlights and how we're managing Zendesk through the current economic crisis, setting us on a path to emerge as a stronger business. In the first quarter, our revenue increased 31% year over year. Revenue growth in every region exceeded 30% as we're making good progress on our international leadership initiatives. Also proud to say our new head of EMEA sales started in April. Gap gross margin for the first quarter was 74.9%, up 560 basis points year over year. Non-gap gross margin was 78.3%, up 480 basis points year over year. Gross margin improvement was driven largely by customer success initiatives and cloud optimization. Gap operating margin for the quarter improved 680 basis points, and non-gap operating margin improved 360 basis points. This includes 6.5 million expense consisting of a one-time stipend for our employees as they transitioned to working from home. The additional cost arising from cancellation of our flagship conference relate and increased bad debt expense driven by customer collection concerns due to COVID-19. Operating cash flow in the first quarter was negative 2.6 million. Free cash flow in the first quarter was negative 15.6 million. Free cash flow was impacted by the amount and timing of bookings, our partnering with customers facing business challenges in light of COVID-19, and the implementation of our new procedure to invoice customers on their renewal date instead of 30 days prior. This new policy started on March 1st, and the cash flow related to those invoices will impact Q1 and Q2. Free cash flow was also impacted by the timing of vendor payments. And now quickly on our strategy moving forward and our view on our outlook. As you're well aware, COVID-19 has caused massive global disruption. We're carefully monitoring leading indicators and performing scenario planning to help inform our forecasts and plans, including demand generation, conversion, pace of booking, churn and contraction, and product usage. 
we believe in the fundamental strength of our business model and the resiliency of our customer base. We have important and valued customers in industries that are facing significant pressure, including airlines, retail, ride sharing, and travel and hospitality. But overall, our book of business is highly diversified and includes many customers in industries that are doing well in this environment, including co computer software and services, e-commerce and learning platforms, and remote conferencing. Our future financial performance will undoubtedly be impacted by the global economic crisis that has emerged. Starting at the end of Q1, we began to see higher trend of contraction among our smaller customers. That trend has continued early in Q2, and while we expect that to improve as economies begin to revive, we expect it to still outpace historical trends. We're also partnering, partnering with our larger customers who are undergoing business challenges to help them with modified invoicing and subscription terms. This will have a near and intermediate impact on our business, but we believe absolutely in the principle of protecting and partnering with our customer base, and this will be the foundation of our long-term growth. As you would expect, we are carefully monitoring our operating expenses in light of the economic crisis. While our balance sheet is and will remain strong, we are committed to managing our expenses in line with revenue expectations. To that end, we have already implemented substantial expense-saving measures, including a reduction in our hiring plan that we expect to yield savings over the course of 2020. Given the macro uncertainty, we are withdrawing our full year 2020 financial guidance. We are, however, providing Q2 guidance to give you the best insight into the quarter ending June 30, 2020. At the midpoint, our Q2 revenue guidance reflects 23% year-over-year growth. Embedded in our operating income guidance is approximately $8 million of COVID-related expense, including continuing support of our employees working from home and bad debt expense. We are in a good position to weather this crisis and, and, and emerge as a better, stronger company. Our customer experience solutions are even more relevant in this new environment. We are confident in this. We have a strong balance sheet, diverse customer base, and a compelling subscription-based business model. We are in position to invest, and we are continuing to invest in our product platform and go-to-market initiatives and infrastructure. These investments are focused to ensure we exit this crisis with strength. Thank you to all of our customers and all, all of our employees. I'll turn it back over to Mark. Uh, thanks, Elena. Um, uh, David, we're uh, ready to begin the Q&A session. Certainly. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star one on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound or hash key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Your first question comes from the line of Phil Winslow with Wells Fargo. Your line is open. Hey, uh, thanks guys for taking my uh, uh, question and uh, glad to hear that y'all are well and hope the same is true for your, your families. Uh, question for Elena, obviously you flagged some uh, some factors here that'll impact reported billings. Uh, obviously you already flagged the, the change in invoicing last quarter, but also the, just the change in invoicing and subscription terms you know, due to COVID. I wonder if you'd help us unpack that because obviously if we take the change in short-term RPO add that to, to revenue, it looked like the short-term RPO bookings number is up 34%. So I wonder if you could kind of, kind of help us unpack, the, unpack those as far as what the impact was Q1 and how you're thinking about those going forward. And then just one quick follow -up. Yeah, sure. So, sure. Um, so first of all, um, we're really encouraged by RPO overall. It just demonstrates the commitment of our customers, our, our enterprise and commercial customers to to do business with us, but but the other more important thing we're seeing is shorter invoice durations, even from some of our larger customers. So that's really what what's what's um, driving that sort of difference between uh, RPO and billing. That that was your question, right? Yeah, and if you could help us kind of maybe think about the the, the impact there that that, that delta. The I mean, delta in terms of, of where, the... what's coming from where? Yeah, so how much is the the 30 day later invoicing versus you know, call it the COVID-related changes. Um, we're, we, we're not going to share the the impact of the billings, but uh, I can tell you that it's uh, going to it's going to impact us over two quarters. Got it. And then just a, a follow-up for for uh, Mikkel. Uh, obviously, you talked about working with your customers. One of the things that Zendesk has been known for has been an extremely high renewal rate. Uh, what do you have in, in place to you know, maybe you know, reach out to customers early that are potentially in impact verticals, kind of work work with them as sort of on a, a sort of front-footed versus uh, waiting for the renewals? 
Um, I mean, that's, a, that's a really good question. We are being really proactive with our customers and try to help them through this situation and so that they also, so we can help them come out on the other side stronger too. Um, and like, I can just say that we are still very proud of our renewal rate, uh, but we are helping customers in any other aspect that we can, of course. Does this make sense? Got it. Thanks, and uh, stay safe. Your next question comes from the line of Ken Wong with Guggenheim Securities. Your line is open. Great. Uh, I wanted to touch uh, a little bit on what Phil was asking earlier, uh, perhaps just on the on the larger customers. You mentioned, I think we we understand the adjusting invoicing, but in terms of subscription terms, what what, what does that look like? Is that is that a temporary price reduction? Is that dialing back on on maybe multi year commitments? Help, help us understand kind of what what you guys are doing there to to, to bridge the gap. Uh, yeah, so it's um, it's really it's it's unique to different customers. Some of them uh, want uh, extended payment terms. Some of them uh, want uh, you know perhaps a, a one time discount. It, it's it's all different flavors. The, the important thing is we're trying to retain and do everything we can to be, show empathy uh, and make sure that we keep these customers for the long haul. Got it. And, and then. Then maybe one follow-up. Uh, in the prepared remarks, you guys touched on, you know, kind of going through a variety of, of scenarios. Um, any color on how you guys are, are bookending those scenarios in terms of potential best and worst case outcomes for, for kind of magnitude and duration of, of, of the this impact? Yeah, no, we're, uh, we're running uh, various scenarios. Uh, we even started with a, a quick recovery, which we all appreciate has not happened. Um, but without being an economist, I think we're basically evaluating a couple of scenarios. One, which is a longer recovery into 2020, and another one, which is a longer recovery into 2021. That's sort of the, the time frame we're thinking about. But uh, I just want to make sure to clarify it's a super fluid situation and, and continues to evolve. Great. Thanks a lot. Your next question comes from the line of Kirk Matterney with Evercore ISI. Your line is open. Yes. Uh, thanks very much. I, I was wondering, Michael, if you could just talk about sort of the, the need to sort of thread the needle these days with, you know, managing expenses, but not want to sort of shift the car into neutral per se, meaning, you know, obviously the beauty of a SaaS model is that you, you don't feel it sort of as much on the upfront, but, you know, a year from now when things are clearing up, if you don't make investments in, say, sales and R&D today, you know, it takes you a little bit longer to sort of get back into motion. So how are you thinking about that in terms of just balancing that? And I don't know, I'm sure Elaine has some, some thoughts on that, but I'd be just kind of curious about how you think about hiring and those kind of things in this kind of environment. Thanks. Um, if I'm starting, um, what we one of the principles we started out with at, in our response to this is that we need to make the organization very, very agile. You know, like and, and that means that like really focus on some things with true impact and kind of there's some other things where we can kind of you know uh, where we don't need to give things the same focus. Um, is exactly to give the organization uh, agility so we can quickly scale up and down uh, given kind of the conditions in the market. And I think that's very important because as you say, or as, as you know, it's a very fluid situation. It's a very volatile market and we have to constantly adapt to kind of what we see and the signals we're getting from everywhere in the world. Um, so we're really focusing on giving the organization as much agility as possible so we can be very fluid in our motions and and uh, ex uh, accelerate investments where we think it makes sense, but also be ready to move those investments over to other areas. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thanks very much. All right. Elena, do you want to add anything? Yeah, no, I think you covered it, Michael. I think the key is, you know, obviously we are benefiting from some of the natural savings. We, we, we have, you know, no one in our, in our employee base traveling. So we get some of that natural tailwind. Uh, and then we're, as we're looking at hiring, we're making sure we're putting those hires into areas that will will drive, will position us for strength as we come out of this. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is we were really good at hiring um, sales in, in Q1, so I'm not super worried about uh, what I have in terms of quota on the street. So feel good about that. That's very helpful. Thanks a lot. 
Your next question comes from the line of Samad Samana with Jeffries. Your line is open. Hi, good evening, and thanks for taking my questions. I uh, hope everybody is staying safe and, and doing as well as you can in this environment. Um, uh, first, maybe one for, for you, Mikkel. You know, on, on Sunshine, uh, that was obviously a big release, and, and Relate was moved to virtual. I'm just curious if you've seen any unique use cases during COVID and if, cu if customers are still adopting Sunshine or how we should think about maybe the, the ramp cycle for Sunshine, and then I have a follow-up. Yeah, we definitely uh, we definitely continue to see uh, demand for the Sunshine platform. We are also trying to really help our customers making it um, much faster than for them to use Sunshine, uh, and we have some really good uh, really good capabilities and features there, and some really good interesting things in our roadmap because that's definitely what our customers need right now. Quick solutions; they need time to value very very quickly, and so some of the some of the I would say some of the things we've seen outside of the U.S., we really see that in the U.S. now, like this really time, the focus on time to value and having very agile platforms. And we are helping customers uh, see that potential and see that value in Sunshine. The conversation pl pl platform that is part of Sunshine has really seen very, very strong demand. Like this is, this is definitely a, 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 a point in time where everybody sees the potential in better using these messaging channels over um, over uh, traditional, much more convenient for us as consumers being trapped home rather than having to sit on the phone waiting for a long time or these very asynchronous uh, conversations over email, like like this kind of very intimate relations, this very intimate conversation that works on your terms um, has been, has turned out to be very very convenient for the environment right now, and we're seeing uh, we're seeing uh, uptake of that, and, and really believe that this is a a, a a time for the for the business relevancy of the messaging platforms. That's helpful, and then Elena, maybe as I think about the the framework for two Q guidance, um, it's twenty four percent is impressive, all things considered. What's going on? I guess I'm, I'm curious when you think about the the uh, the slight slowdown. How much of that is as a result of gross retention declining versus less new bookings activity? Can you can you maybe parse out those two factors? Yeah, no, definitely. I think the I, I would say it's more oriented to the the contraction we're seeing uh, in our business, which um, you know continues to be very fluid. Uh, but that's definitely a key part of what's included in that guidance, and so I would I would orient it more to that. Um, okay, that's, I apologize. That's... Go ahead. Great. I, okay, sorry, I was going to say I apologize. I'm going to squeeze the third one in, then just as a follow up. So when you think about new bookings activity, is that more with your with larger customers or with smaller customers? Just trying to think about where new business activity is still happening. Thanks again for taking my questions. Uh, I think you're seeing we're seeing some, we're seeing new business across uh, different different segments really. Um, we're we're seeing some larger customers that want something up and running very quickly, and we're seeing still the usual self service. I wouldn't say that uh, it's not been impacted by COVID. Definitely, some of our really large um, customers may say, "I need I need a little bit more time. I need to double click before I commit." But um, the new businesses come in and from different segments, as well as, as, as always, the expansion of our existing customers is a big driver of bookings for us. Your next question comes from the line of Arjun Badia with William Blair. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Um, first, on the go to market was was wondering if you could maybe just walk through how that strategy has has shifted to kind of adapt to this environment. you know what are you doing from a messaging perspective? Um, are you leading with perhaps different different products um, where customers see maybe a faster time to value and that are more need and then to tack onto that, do you think this you know kind of coming out of this environment it will accelerate your new up market? Um, as SMBs, you know, become a little bit more cash strapped. Uh, I know you've been going in that direction a while, but some color there would be great. Um, yeah, so let me give an initial answer to that. Um, so I would say that, like, it, like we definitely, like, we definitely um, double down on our uh, unique strengths 
and that is that we can we can get large complex organizations up and running very very quickly and we can give them like we can decrease their time to value and really uh, uh, help them get results out of the gates and that is incredibly relevant right now uh, like some of our largest deal larger deals these days have very short uh, cycles um, and uh, customers basically are almost up and running before we have negotiated the deal so like we, we're definitely kind of we're definitely responding to the environment and like we definitely focus on the qualities that are that have always been part of our uh, vocabulary that is really, really relevant right now. And we actually, we actually uh, it is our belief that these things are gonna, these things are gonna define the business, the future business climate too. You know, we, we're not gonna have time for all these big complicated uh, anchors in our, in, in our IT infrastructure. We need to be more agile as a, you know, not just in our IT systems, but as a population, you know, to come properly through this and to make sure we can get the economy up and running again and to make sure that we can come out of this stronger, not just as companies, and, but as a population, as, as a world, you know, and like Zendesk is 100% behind this and we believe that that's, 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 where we, that's where we need to bring the world so we don't hold each other back and so we can act quickly, so we can be agile, so we can keep up and live up to the expectations of the world around us that our customers have to us. Make sense? Yes, it's very helpful. Um, and um, Elena, a, a quick follow-up for you. Um, I remember uh, reading in the shareholder letter um, that you know interactions are increasing and volumes are increasing and people are maybe scaling up their, their service operations. Um, one of the things I want to ask on that, you know, I know a portion of your business is usage-based, uh, you know, it might be small, but answer bot and conversations uh, would certainly fit in that category. I'm, I'm wondering, are you seeing a, a revenue impact from that, or is that, um, you know, not where that, that core usage uh, increase is coming in? Actually, what's interesting is we're seeing some customers increase their usage during this time, uh, to be honest. So we're, we're seeing both, but we're really seeing... Uh, encouraged by seeing some customers who actually um, are needing Zendesk more and increasing their usage. So um, it's not, I'm not seeing a, a dampening as much there. Um, I would say in our ProServe revenue, uh, to the extent they're attached to very large uh, enterprise deals, uh, that's definitely a, a, a place we're paying attention to because that has slowed a little bit. But in terms of our usage, I would say it's, it's um, quite the contrary. We're actually seeing more uptake Thanks for the questions. Your next question comes from the line of Alex Zuckin with RBC Capital Markets. Your line is open. Hey guys, thanks for taking my question, and I'm glad to hear you're uh, you're staying safe. Uh, maybe just a, a, a couple, Elena. Maybe can you talk on what you know? Go through maybe the exposure that, that you guys see to have to troubled sectors versus healthier sectors of the economy. If you can, you know, give us a uh, a sizing is it you know 20% of the business is it 50% of the business and um, then I got a quick follow up yeah um when we when we look at our numbers if you include all of the the typical ones people talk about whether it's travel ride share um forgetting some mark keep me honest on what they are but but it's in that 20% range uh for us and it's across and then you know all of our it's across all of our segments too it's not just um it's not just in the SMB or in, in our prize. It's really across. When I say that, it's across our entire book of business. Understood. And I guess so. If you if you could help us understand where you're seeing most of the degradation in, in the uh, not maybe the the dollar renewal rate, or is it in the SMB part? Is it in the enterprise? And if you can help us understand, you know, where those rates are trending, because on the one hand, you you know, it sounds like current RPO. Uh, bookings or billings is a better you know, grade of kind of some of that new ACV behavior uh, versus billings, but yet you know, you're, you, you, you're pulling the guide. So I just want to understand, is it the retention or, or the churn spike that, that's driving that? Or so if you could help us understand that. Yeah, I mean, um, it's a fair question, Alex. But as you know, the the the, uh, the market conditions are super volatile and fluid. I think the the key for me, as I was studying guidance, was really thinking about the contraction we're seeing 
in our customer base and uh, just being thoughtful about that. But the impact we're seeing um, in terms of the highly impacted industries is across both SMB and enterprise. It's not only uh, SMB customers, but the contraction we're seeing, uh, like I said, is, is mostly oriented to these highly impacted uh, industries. Yeah, Alex, let me, um, yeah, I just want to clarify that most of that is contraction oriented. If you think about many travel related companies, they have, you know, their business is down 80% or, or, or more sometimes. And so we've been working with those customers to make sure that we can keep them uh, in, a, in a place where they come back to us when uh, travel conditions and hospitality uh, industry conditions come back. Uh, understood. And maybe just that I could sneak one more in. Can you talk about, I mean, contractually, are these customers with multi-year contracts, you know, that you're proactively going in and, and changing their contracts or how, how is that working exactly? Is that on renewal? Uh, Alex, on the um, shareholder letter, you'll see that we made uh, a statement. Um, there are times where we will work with companies on their subscription terms uh, to uh, help them manage through this period, especially if they're in one of those heavily impacted industries. Got it. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Chris Merwin with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Hey, thanks so much for taking my question. Um, I just wanted to ask about the product portfolio and particularly, I guess, in these conditions, where are you seeing more resilient demand? Is it in core support, just given the importance of companies engaging with customers sometimes through online channels for the very first time, or maybe with analytics as customers try to think through some new challenges they're, they're facing? Just, just curious in general where you've been positively surprised with the resilience of, of certain products and, and perhaps other areas where uh, it's been more of a temporary challenge. Um, I, I, I think it's it's a little bit across the board, and I would say that like if you look at a quarter like this, like there's there's too many different signals for us to point anything out. I do want to say that like one of the overall trends that we've seen, and that is truly being accelerated right now, is the adoption of kind of the newer uh, messaging oriented channels. Uh, that that has turned out to be very convenient for a lot of customers. It's very convenient for a lot of like end users slash consumers. Uh, so this is definitely where we see uh, uh, this. We definitely see a trend there. Um, but like overall, uh, like we like uh, there's interest for our products across the board. Great, thank you. And just one quick follow up uh, on RPO. Obviously, um, you know, it's already been asked about the RPO growth. Uh, our current RPO growth, which was which was really strong, you know, long-term RPO growth, you know, decelerated a little bit, still very strong growth rate, and was up a little bit sequentially. I mean, um, anything you can say just about the divergence in in, in trend for those, um, you know, current and long-term RPO? Um, so we're we're continuing. I mean, we're really encouraged by our RPO and really proud of it, especially in this time. I mean, I think the fact that customers are still continuing to commit to us uh, is something we're encouraged by for multi-year contracts, and we're seeing that even during this this sort of stressful COVID time. So I think it's um, it's it's important to be proud of that for us, and I think that um, it's a testament to what the sales organization has done in terms of making sure they they um, share the full value of Zenda. So like, I'm, I'm pretty proud of that. I think in terms of how it relates to uh, billing and so on, I think it really goes back to during this time, we're also working with customers to make sure um, that if they need different payment terms, et cetera, we're really um, helping them through that. And this is coming from, you know, even larger customers. Got it, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Stan Flotke with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Um, thank you so much for taking my questions. Um, and I, I hope you're, uh, everybody's staying safe and uh, um, healthy, obviously. Um, maybe just um, help us characterize what uh, you're seeing through the first, you know, let's call it, you know, uh, four weeks uh, of the current quarter and what you're seeing through April, because obviously I'm, I'm sure March, end of March was, was pretty terrible, but what are you seeing uh, quarter to date? And then I have a, a quick follow-up. 
Uh, yeah, so we're um, like I like I said on the script, we're we're still seeing contraction mostly, especially with our SMB customers. Uh, I, I'm encouraged that we're not seeing uh, as much churn, but more contraction, and I think that's really important sign for us because we believe as the economy comes back, we'll start to see some of these customers come back. And I think we talked about it earlier, but also a lot of that is coming from. Uh, customers in these industries that are that have you know that are highly distressed at the moment, and so we're really trying to work with them. Uh, we'll see. I mean, we're looking at these signals daily, weekly, uh, and if that changes, obviously that would be a positive. But right now, um, we're seeing still the same kind of tone we saw or the late part of March into early April. Okay, perfect. And then maybe just. To- change the tone a little bit, you know, because there's so much negativity overall, but, you know, looking at the positives, right? Um, so you, you guys are giving away this uh, this remote working bundle, uh, and, you know, you're also giving away the product to startups working on COVID-19. Um, could there be, you know, when we were all coming out on the other end of this, uh, an increased uptake of things like the Explore uh, product, or maybe just greater adoption of Zendesk within some of these newer startups popping up um, that could, we could start to see the benefits as we get into maybe the second half of the year and into 2021. Well, I, I mean, let me maybe let me answer or try to answer. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to. Um, I, I want to be very realistic about the situation we are in and the uncertainty in the market and this uncertainty about the global market. Well, we, 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 and we have, we are kind of being very humble to what's going on with our customers and the situation they're in right now, because it, it's of course everyone, but that I impacted. But I do want to say that like, we believe that we, we as a company, we have a responsibility to kind of help customers through this and come out strong on the other side. And that, that also, we're doing that because we want to invest in our relationship and in our trust with these companies. And we, we have, as a business, we've always been the kind of company that got up every morning and tried to earn the trust of our company, of our customers. And this is a defining moment for us in ensuring that we can really do that. And that will, you know, if, without speculating in the future here, that will lead to, from our, our belief is that it will lead to better customer relationships and more trust in us and in our products and understanding of the value that our products bring to that business. It's a high level. Yes, you're right. Even though that you know we're not trying to take advantage of a of a bad situation. You, does that make sense, Dan? Yes, of course. It makes a lot of sense. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Brad Sills with B of A Securities. Your line is open. Oh, hey guys, thanks for taking my question. I, I wanted to ask about net revenue retention, um, you know, held in in that kind of 115 uh, level this quarter. And I'm hearing that there's some increased activity in customers, which could lead to more seats, I would imagine. But on the other hand, you've, you're seeing obviously contraction in other areas of the business. So I guess what's your expectation or what have you seen even in the, the, the first month here of the quarter uh, with regard to net, reten- net revenue retention, um, kind of the growth side and then the upsell? And, and where do you think that could trend over the year? Um, so I won't comment on the full year, obviously, because the situation is so fluid. But um, you know, consistent with what I what I just talked about, we're definitely seeing contraction uh, across these industries where we have uh, we're seeing distress. Uh, the pace of our um, our bookings is a, you know in start of the quarter is pacing okay. But I think we obviously look at everything holistically, and so we have to to look at those together. And and right now we're seeing. Um, you know, contraction. That that said, this could change very quickly. As quickly as it came, it could change. And so, I don't want to predict what what this will be. Uh, but we factored what this will what the trend will be for the full, full quarter. But we took all of that into consideration in our guidance. Got it. Thanks very much. And then um, just just one on the global SI channel. I know that was a big that was an increasing focus here in developing some of these uh, global SI partnerships. How does the situation impact that? I, I know that you, you mentioned that um, some of the bigger expand deals, uh, you've seen a little bit of a pause there. I, I, I assume that's focused a lot in the global SI channel. Just any update on how that's progressing in the midst of all this? Thank you. 
we <laughs> sorry, <laughs> we're trying to figure out how to teach right there. I, <laughs> I, you know, like partners, um, partners have proven to be a really, really important part of our ecosystem, and they're going to continue to be an increasingly important part of the ecosystem. Um, what, what kind of partners? Um, like, it's not like the 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 big global SIs that are the most agile right now, uh, but like I think they will also accommodate to the new world order uh, and, and be better at that. But like our partners is a big part of our ecosystem. And Mark, you maybe want to add some, some, some yeah. comment here, sorry. Yeah, I think, uh, Brad, our partners will be an important part of our ecosystem. In this most recent quarter, we actually saw some partners bring in these quick win deals where Companies were looking to make adaptations to what they were doing, and we were, we were able to serve that. And so I think in the near term, that's what you should expect from our partner activity. And then, you know, as market conditions improve, we, we have a product, I think, that people will want to work with over time. Thanks, guys. Your next question comes from the line of Steve Koenig with Wedbush Securities. Your line is open. Hey, thanks, Zendesk, for taking my question. Um, you know, so you talked a little bit about, um, you know, the impact to your financials. You're expecting it to be over the short and medium term. You know, you're, you're obviously appropriately uncertain because the environment is uncertain. Um, I'd like to try to understand a little better, though, how the, how the contraction plays out with respect to the mechanics of your billings terms and, and your total contract duration. So, you know, if I have it right, I know that you've got, you know, a mix of, of uh, shorter than annual and annual and even some multi-year um, contracts. And your billings terms have been moving more towards annual, I think, with a goal of getting 70% annual. Does the, contra does the contraction happen um, when a, only when a customer renews, or is it, is it happening? Are they asking for concessions when, when a bill hits them and, they, and you can't collect? Um, and, and then does this – is this going to extend into multi-year contracts um, as well? So kind of help me understand how that plays out with respect to these contracts getting renewed and, and the billings periods as well. Yeah, so uh, if I understand, that's a complex question, but I think if I understand you correctly, you're asking um, when do these contractions happen? Do they happen at yeah. renewal or do they happen off cycle? Um, and yeah. so it's important to understand we have both annual and, and monthly customers, obviously. Um, and so a monthly customer theoretically could, you know, every, every month renew. Um, but some of it is happening off cycle. Um, but typically uh, you're seeing it, and it, it depends on the size of the customer, the customers that have annual contracts. If they're in a, in a distressed industry, there may be a handful of those that are coming before their renewal to, to uh, look for uh, different payment terms. In other cases, it's at renewal. So it's a little bit of both. It's not, it's not one or the other. Mm -hmm. and, and just a quick follow-up, Elena, when, when you, you do have some multi-year contracts, I believe, and, um, you know, would, would, you, would you expect that, you know, the concessions you're granting them then stabilize when you get to another year of the contract or could is medium term, you know, could it be longer than a year or does it just totally depend on the environment? It depends on the environment. It depends on, on the customer and what their needs are. You know, they're, they're with, with larger customers, everyone's needs are a little different in terms of their cash position and, and whatnot. Um, but we're, we're trying to, to think about, you know, what does this customer look like over the long haul, over a multi-year contract? We're, we're trying to avoid, Obviously, uh, changing contract terms, that's, that's something we mm -hmm. prefer not to do, but rather really think about yeah. how can we sh help them in the short and uh, intermediate term so that when they come out of it as they grow, um, then we're back in a good position with them. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Sure. Your next question comes from the line of Derek Wood with Cowan & Company. Your line is open. Great, thanks. It's Andrew on for Derek. Hope you're all well. You locked down business travel pretty early in the in the COVID cycle. Any color on how this has affected close rates and rep behavior and how are reps adjusting to selling virtually? You know, uh, 
I've actually been really encouraged and impressed with our sales team uh, and actually with all of our employees to pivot, you know, almost overnight to working from home uh, and, and send us time to value and, and all the, all the things that we talk about, um, I think will do well in this environment. Um, I don't see that necessarily being challenged unless it's a really huge deal. Of course, some of that is, um, you know, potentially slipping, but not, not in a material way. I think we can still, uh, do business and and um, continue to close deals, and we've proven that in Q1 and, and continuing to prove that through Q2 uh, in a virtual environment. Great. And then, Elena, maybe what percentage of your revenue or billings come from new versus existing customers, and what are you assuming around growth in each cohort for the year? So we don't really um, – give distinct, uh, we don't break out our bookings or billings between new and expansion, but obviously uh, the expansion motion is a big part of our, our growth. And um, you, you guys know that is looking at our net expansion rate, uh, but we are continuing to, to deliver on both new and expansion bookings, but we don't break those out. Great, thanks, take care. Again, if you would like to ask a question, press star 1 on your telephone. Your next question comes from the line of Jeff Van Reed with Craig Howell. Your line is open. Great, thanks. Just a couple for me. I think um, from a geographic standpoint, can you just talk to, I guess, two, two aspects? Um, churn variance by geography, if you've noticed any, and then also within the selling motion, the ability to get cycles you know, over the finish line, if you will, um, maybe just talk to things sort of through the geographic lens, if you can call out any notable differences. You know, we haven't. Uh, so in terms of, um, in terms of, you know, contraction, uh, it's, I haven't noticed any particular um, trend that's such an outlier that's, that's, you know, something we would mention here. Um, but of course, uh, every region is experiencing uh, this differently. So we may see pockets of countries come back sooner than others. We're paying attention to that. Uh, but I wouldn't say that there's a stark, complete difference between, say, AMERA or EMEA or APEC at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then on the on the cycles, um, I think Nicole called out some, you know, you've seen some urgency. Some cycles have been fairly large and come in with great urgency. When you look at the deals that have come in with urgency, what's been the, the makeup of the deals in terms of what feature function capabilities they were most focused on? What what were the drivers there? I think there was a similar question on that before. Like it, it's really across the board here. Like it, it's really about ensuring that a business can uh, engage and respond to their to their uh, customers, to their communities, to their stakeholders. Um, and as I said earlier, we definitely see a drive to more towards like more like the sync, like the, the the messaging and chat channels over the traditional channels. Uh, but really, the the demand is across the board, and and you know even across some of our sales products, you know the demand is built across the board. Yeah, good enough. Okay, great. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Jennifer Lowe with UBS. Your line is open. Great, thank you. Um, I wanted to, Elena, just to circle back quickly to, to hit home some of the things that have kind of gotten discussed earlier. You know, as we're talking about some of the, the adjustments and um, the concessions that are being made to customers to help them through challenging times, is it fair to think that that will be a billings impact but shouldn't be something that, that affects RPO or CRPO or could it be CRPO but not an RPO impact, you know, can you just help us understand sort of what's cash versus contract? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think the most of the orientation has been on payment terms so far, but it's early to tell. Um, we're still going through, you know, and talking to customers actively, uh, but I can I definitely say that um, payment terms has been a big, big topic with customers. Uh, I'm not going to say that we won't. Uh, change contract terms, but um, definitely the, the orientation has been um, payment term. And in some cases, you know, as customers are needing fewer agents in this time, we're, we're seeing that come through. Uh, but it's, the flip side is we expect that to come back as the economy starts to revive. Great. 
And then just looking at, you know, the puts and takes on billings in the quarter, and, you know, again, you mentioned there was the invoicing change, there's these payment concessions. I think you said that you know, expect this to last for uh, two quarters. But just thinking of, you know, sort of the magnitude there, because it seems like the invoicing component would be, the invoicing change would be relatively contained in Q1 as, as kind of a one-time event. Would you expect a similar degree of headwinds in Q2 billings? Um, you know, just any kind of qualification that would be helpful as we, we try to think about what this Sure. Is. Like, I think the one thing to just think about is uh, even though we bill, we don't always – um, so, so the billing um, impact is we, we effectively had two two months of um, billings instead of three. Um, so that's sort of the the impact there. Um, what I mean is we should expect cash flow for Q2 to have that same uh, uh, impact as well, simply because obviously we're collecting some of that billing in Q2. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Great, thank you. There are no further questions at this time. I will turn the call back over to the presenters. Well, we'd like to uh, thank you for joining us on our virtual call. Um, and uh, we will uh, look forward to speaking to you next quarter. Have Ladies a great and day and stay safe. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.